Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our, our webinar today, it, uh, Tools and Techniques to Visualize an Eco-Friendly Home. Uh, we've got an amazing lineup of presenters uh, that are gonna talk about the right combination of hardware and software that you'll need to create gorgeous architectural visualizations. Uh, first today, we're gonna have Dan Stone, who is a V-Ray certified trainer from uh, the Archilime Academy in the UK. He's gonna be walking us through his complete visualization workflow, including a bunch of the key new features available now in V-Ray 6. Then we're gonna have Andrew Rink from NVIDIA share some details about their latest advancements in GPU tech and how all of that speed can be used to help you create stunning renders and animations faster than ever before. Then we'll have Lenovo's Chris Rufo on to share some insights about the best workstations and mobile workstations that you can use to speed up high-end rendering and visualization workflows. So then, and Dan, maybe you can go to the next slide here. As an added bonus, uh, we're giving away a complete visualization starter kit at the end of the webinar to one uh, lucky attendee. So this prize is pretty amazing. It's gonna include a Lenovo P16 mobile workstation that has a, an NVIDIA uh, RTX A5500 GPU. Uh, plus you'll be able to have a year license of V-Ray and a free custom training from the Arculime Academy. So in a second here, I'm gonna post a raffle link into the chat. And uh, sometime during the webinar, go ahead and click on that raffle link so that you can enter the, uh, the contest to be picked at random for this. And be sure to stay until the end of the webinar for your chance to win. So um, we wanna make sure that the winner is here to uh, as at the end to be announced. So uh, without further ado, um, you know, we're excited to have all of these experts with us today. Confident you're gonna find this informative and inspiring. Um, so, so go ahead and take it away, Dan. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Thank you. And thanks for having us. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you guys. So um, to give you a bit of background on, uh, on, on me initially, I am, uh, I'm Dan, as Lon says, and I'm the co-founder and director of operations at the Arculime Academy. And now I've been a V-Ray and SketchUp user for about 10 years professionally with our uh, professional uh, visualization studio, Arculine Visualizations, based here in the UK. And I personally, I counted the other day, I've managed or overseen around two and a half thousand CGIs. So it's, it took me quite a while to count those. But um, what I'd like to, to talk to you in a bit more detail about is um, what the Arculine Academy um, is all about to begin with before we progress into the Palm Springs project. So um, I'll give you an example of some of our work that we've done over the years, uh, a few of the two and a half thousand that we've been producing. Uh, now the Arclime Academy, it's a, a bit of a byproduct really of our visualization department. So nowadays we offer free educational webinars, um, tons of courses for all levels of SketchUp and V-Ray users. So if you're an architect, interior designer, landscape architect, set designer, hobbyist, you know, pretty much anyone that's got any interest in 3D, there's definitely a case for, you know, integrating V-Ray and rendering into your skill set. And that's basically what our public and private courses are designed to do. So whether that kind of slots onto the end of your workflow or kind of integrates within it currently, uh, that's what we're here for. So we do ongoing consultations as well, just to help these same studios, architects, landscape architects, interior designers, just to help basically create a visualization department of their own. And uh, so we've been doing this for quite a few years now, helping people out with, with training, like I mentioned, as well as like hardware advice and licensing as well more recently. So we're led by um, V-Ray certified trainers. Um, some of you guys, I, could, I recognize your name. So thanks so much for coming along. Um, now, over the years, we have worked on quite a, quite a few projects, but the main one I want to talk to you about is the Palm Springs project. Now, the brief for this that we were given by uh, Koto Design, who I'll talk to you in a bit more detail about later, um, it was to create a, um, a visualization package for a serene single residence uh, based out of Palm Springs. 
Now, Koto design, their style is heavily influenced by, as you can see, like Japanese and Scandinavian elements. I've heard the term Japandi thrown around. I don't know uh, if that's going to stick or not, but uh, we'll go with that. Um, and a real key part of this entire process was the uh, solar shading, you know, making sure that our lighting was as correct as it could possibly be. So, as I said, Koto Design, they were the architects for this project, but we also worked very closely with the guys at Chaos, Lenovo and NVIDIA to put this together. So a, a big, big team effort. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is some of the insights and the lessons that we've learned as professionals on this project and give you a bit of a behind the scenes of how it was built using the technology which is available for everyone. So this project in particular, we used tons of real-time rendering techniques. So uh, very GPU heavy, um, which is where obviously uh, Chris and Andrew, I'm sure would like to uh, kind of interject later on. Collaboration was important. So I want to talk to you about how you can manage projects regardless of where you are in the world. And generally just give you some tips on how to make best use of V-Ray to achieve photorealistic results in less time. <laughs> That's sort of what this is all about. So um, this webinar is gonna be recorded as, um, as I'm sure you're all aware. And what I'd like to do is also send you out this base SketchUp model of this project. So just like the main massing so that you can go away and have a play with some of these techniques yourselves. If anyone's got any questions, please do uh, drop them in the, the chat box or the Q&A box. And we've got uh, lots of people on board just to, just to curate those and we can address that at the end. Yeah, okay. thanks. It's probably good to note that we'll have a uh, Q&A session at the end. So if anybody's got questions, we'll address them sort of in the last 15 minutes there. Don't go easy on us. <laughs> we, like, we like the hard ones. Um, so first thing I'd like to talk to you about is Chaos Vantage. So this, as I'm sure um, those of you that have heard of this before, know that it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a bit of a game-changing tool, really, for artists and designers, giving people the ability to look at and explore complex production scenes in real time. So the whole point of this is that it's really it's a simple drag-and-drop functionality. You know, you can take your V-Ray scenes... Uh, you import your V-Ray scene, sorry, into Vantage, and you can just start navigating them immediately, much like, uh, much like you can see here. So there's a direct live link available with SketchUp as well. So you can almost, if you've got two monitors, you can have Vantage open on one monitor and SketchUp in the other. And it's, uh, it's kind of like a real-time live link. So uh, like a real-time renderer, if you will, but just incredibly uh, high-powered. So the benefits of this is that it saves time and streamlines that design review process. Uh, so you don't need to spend any time optimizing geometry, unwrapping UVs, or doing any light baking that some of you may have experienced in other, uh, in other gaming engines. So like I say, it's, this is really good for design exploration, um, validating and presenting your work, as well as uh, some good quality photorealistic pre-visualization stuff as well. So we, we use this uh, with our sister company, Arculine Visualizations. We very often suggest to clients that, you know, come into our office or we'll hold an online review meeting where we'll just have Chaos Vantage running in the background. Um, and then they can just make changes as and when they see fit. You know, we record the session and it's, it's just a really nice seamless process. Um, you could, it's got tons of other features where you can recall different views and scene states as well. So things like lighting conditions for set scenes, um, just generally create really immersive uh, interactive experiences. So the short, it effectively shortens that feedback loop um, between uh, the client and you as the artist. Now, naturally, this is something that um, you know, I can't talk about Vantage without talking about the RTX GPUs. Um, this is something which works with RTX graphics cards. So what you'll find is throughout this process, I'll, I'll mention the RTX GPUs along the way. And I know that Andrew would like to talk to you in a bit more detail about those later as well. 
So one thing that's really cool about this, Dan, is in the RTX cards, they have ray tracing chips. So that's the, you know, that's what's one of the things that's accelerating this ray tracing. And the, the beautiful thing besides, you know, the fact that you get a better photorealistic look from it is ray tracing can handle massive amounts of geometry. Yeah. Um, so this is your production scene, right? This has got all of the rocks, all of the gravel, the trees, the shrubs. <laughs> Um, you know, there's no low poly content in this like you might do for a game engine. It's really the whole the whole thing just drag and drop into yeah. advantage. Um, another thing that's really cool about this system is you can actually render out of it. So you can create, you know, animation, you can render still frames um, and you could render them at like 4K in seconds or you know if you want to do super high quality you can do it maybe in 30 seconds or a, or a minute of frame yeah. and, and the quality of animation that you can get out of it's pretty pretty incredible it's it's such it's it's changed the way that we present ideas nowadays um i think the um the use case for this interactively is what appeals to me uh, the most and i think the ability to like Lon says, just contains so much information and then you don't lose any of that. Um, you can see down at the bottom here, the VRAM, you know, that's that's a huge, huge bandwidth to be able to store um, your complex V-Ray scenes. So if you are producing complex V-Ray scenes and you have struggled in the past with ways to show that interactively, this is a really nice way of doing that. So something else I'd like to talk to you about, just kind of um, going, um, a slightly off piece with this one is to talk about chaos cloud so this is something that has been around for uh, a little while now a few versions of b-ray and um the whole process behind this is that this is a way for you to collaborate with other uh stakeholders in your project so an example of how this could work here is one i prepared earlier um a lot earlier, actually. This is one I did before Christmas, but just like a, uh, <laughs> as you can see, there's a lovely Christmas tree, and we've got some, we've got Rudolph on the uh, balcony there. Um, the process for if um, I wanted to uh, put this up for comments to a colleague or even to the client, it's really easy. Just to when you, when it's in the frame buffer, you can head up to File and then upload the image to Chaos Collaboration or directly from the history uh, sidebar of your frame buffer, um, do the same thing there. And what happens is that then loads into your portal. So this is your, uh, once you've logged in, I think I'm on my colleague Jack's account here, but um, you can see that there's uh, two tabs, collaboration, and you can create lots of different projects. And uh, an example that I'd like to show you is of the Palm Springs project. Um, I'd uploaded an image for Lon to comment on uh, before, and uh, he left some very nice comments. Very important comments. Very you know. essential comments, yeah. Um, love the record player and the records below. I can imagine the music playing, maybe playing some Japandi funk, uh, potentially. <laughs> um, you've got all sorts, you can do all sorts with this. So you can add, um, you can see here, I've uh, where Jack added one. You could sort of annotate the screens as well kind of say, oh, I love that tree, you can, yeah, basically it's, it's, it's really nice and interactive and it's all in real time as well. So um, very, very useful if you're working as part of a team um, with this. Um, you can also switch between versions as well, um, which, is very, uh, which is very useful, especially if you're dealing with um, like iterative design that's, that's changing a lot and you need to kind of go back a few versions. So something else you could do with the cloud is, you can render with it. So uh, this is something we um, we have used in the past um, on this project. We actually, um, we, we use the Chaos Cloud rendering service. But just as, as an example, what would happen is when you're, um, let me minimize that for a second. Um, you just hit the render with the Chaos Cloud and then you can head uh, back into your, here we go. Um, head back into your cloud. Once you're logged in and everything, you can upload a job to the portal and it then give you the status here. Um, so you can then go ahead and download your files straight away or through Google Drive, however you like to work. 
Um, generally, it's just a nice way to kind of help alleviate some of that rendering, um, which you may have if you work on uh, projects of the scale of this one. So it's, we use this in conjunction with those RTX, uh, GP, the A6000s that I mentioned earlier. And that's what enabled us to render off all of the images um, that you might have seen of this project um, and also the animation as well. It's just something crazy like 3,000 uh, 3, individual frames all at 4K. So yeah, big help. Um, definitely recommend anyone uses that. Now, the lighting. This was something that um, was one of the key drivers in the design of this project. And it was something which, um, which changed uh, quite a lot along the way. Now, just to give a bit of context, those that don't know, um, the lighting in, uh, sorry, the lighting, the sunlight in Palm Springs um, gives apparently 334 heating days. So it basically means for 334 days of the year, you don't need to add any extra energy into the building to heat it. So that is obviously, that can be a good thing. I'm sat here in the UK where it's freezing cold and I love the sound of that, but um, in Palm Springs, it's obviously a different story. You need to try and minimize that amount of solar gain. So we needed a way to basically get as accurate a sun path, um, well, as accurate sun paths as we can. And for lighting, there's so many different ways of approaching this. What we decided to do was use geolocation. So this isn't anything, you know, all that complex. Those of you that have used SketchUp in the past know that you can simply add a location, a geolocate your model, and that then gives you accurate sun paths for that location, sort of on Earth. Um, what this does is guarantees the, uh, the accuracy of uh, the paths of the sun in the sky. And what that tends to mean then is you would be using the classical V-ray sun and sky model to, uh, well, to light your space, which up until V-ray 6 gave you pretty uninspiring skies. Um, I, I'm sure those of you that have used it know that it's just crystal clear skies. But as you can see here, V-ray 6 came with procedural clouds. So this is a way for us to add a bit more interest to the, to the skies, skyscapes as we were calling it. And um, just manipulate it into the whatever kind of arrangement you think would work for the project. Um, this gives the added benefit as well of still preserving those sun paths. So th that had to be accurate. That was the, the be all and end all for us. And something else that this can offer is the dynamic cloud option, which you can see just at the bottom there, if you guys can see my mouse. And when turned on, that allows you to, when rendering, it's going to allow the clouds to move in the sky. So I don't know if you um, you saw the the shot I did earlier with the with the swimming pool, where the clouds are coming over the top, or the the shot that the three D team of Chaos produced. But that's all dynamic clouds as well. So yeah, very very cool, very easy to work with. The parameters are all pretty self explanatory. So do have a go if you haven't yet. And I guess the kind of a, another question we could ask here is that why we couldn't use a dome light uh, to achieve interesting skies um, because you know a dome light as a big spherical image to light up our spaces is definitely a way to create realistic looking um, skies and, and landscapes as well if, if you like but it's it would you have no degree of customizability with a dome light you you kind of got to work with what you've got um, and we really wanted to track the passage of the sun throughout the day with this project given that lighting and the sun was the key protagonist the next thing i'd like to talk to you about is enmesh which is if those of you that have tried it it's it's the tool that enables you to create those really detailed surfaces in sketchup uh, in sorry in v-ray for sketchup by tiling 3d geometric patterns across surfaces so we use this uh, in lots of places but one use case is here in these gabion walls so you can see how the we're looking at different ways of containing the stone and how the patterns are applied to the surfaces so this eliminates a lot of the need for modeling 
uh, and the use of V-Ray proxies to just experiment with loads of different options. Um, it keeps things op very, very optimized, like you can see here. Um, I'm just setting up a uh, like a test render, a uh, test interactive render, sorry, of a fence I'd like to try and make. Um, so I've kind of got a 3D, basic 3D pattern down below. And after tweaking the orientation and getting that set up, uh, when I restart the render, you can see how it starts to look uh, like the beginnings of a of a fence, which is only one of the use cases. You know, you could be using these um, this tool for something like um, like uh, fences, fabrics, um, chain mail, rattan. You know, pretty much anywhere you need repeating three D geometric patterns, this is perfect for. Um, it's it uses significantly less memory than displacement for my fellow V-Ray nerds out there that are interested in that kind of thing. And uh, unlike instancing, it doesn't use any extra memory for the repeated geometry, which is incredible. So this basically means you can create billions and billions of polygons without adding, adding to the memory consumption, which, yeah, it's um, in incredible tool, incredible tool. Um, this obviously, this example, I'm I'm using uh, lots of different patterns on one flat surface, but as you can see here, on a um, kind of a complex face like a, a throw over a chair, you could be doing the exact same process for that as well. So um, yeah, I kind of go to town, make a nice woolly throw, which I could use right now. To be honest, it's freezing in this office, but um, yeah, this is uh, this is Enmesh. I. I'd, I'd definitely ad advocate for using this, especially if you're an interiors specific artist. I think there's loads of use cases where, where it could help you out. Cool. And then the next thing I'd like to talk to you guys about is uh, the Chaos uh, Cosmos. So I'll just give you a live demo of this because it's easier. Um, you can see here by clicking on, there's the mouse, this button, Chaos Cosmos. Um, those of you that know V-Ray know that these days you've got tons and tons of assets available to you using Chaos Cosmos. Um, just to give you a, a quick demo for the few of you that may not have really come across this before, um, you've got 3D models, materials, HDRIs, like I mentioned earlier, um, as well as collections of um, different assets kind of bundled into, into packs. We... Uh, well, we, we, we're using this on a, on a daily basis, as I'm sure you, you already are. Um, it's very easy to just select, let's pick a person. Let's go with Jet. So we'll click on Jet. I've already downloaded this model before. So once, once you've downloaded it, you can just hit the green button and import into the scene. And you can see that he comes in. I'll minimize that now. You can see that he comes in as a, um, this is like a V-Ray object. You know, um, within SketchUp, it's, it's just a, a white, um, well, th there's not many polygons there. It's deliberately to keep it very light. But when we open up the Asset Editor and the Objects tab, you can see Jet in all of his glory, sat drinking his glass of wine with his fantastic hair. Um, you could do this for all sorts of different models, as, you've, as you can see. And for, uh, for us, we used... Cosmos extensively with Koto Design, especially their interiors team, Koto Living, to populate those interior spaces because of that really distinctive uh, style that they've got. Um, so yeah, lots of different options. Um, internally, it's fantastic. Externally, we used it for a lot of the, uh, the rocks um, that are, I'm gonna show you in the next section. Um, imported a lot of rocks and vegetation to kind of populate the spaces with there as well. So effectively, everything that you would have seen in this Palm Springs project, um, it's all been made with, pretty much all of it has been made with Chaos Cosmos. Maybe there's a few things we modeled up, but for the most part, I'd say like 98% was Cosmos assets. Yeah, and one of the things too, Dan, is that, you know, in Cosmos, you've got material libraries for, for V-Ray as well. So um, not only do you have pre-made models, but you've got pre-made materials that are in there. And we've actually worked quite a bit with uh, real manufacturers on this. So you'll see things that are from, you know, the libraries of swatches of real fabrics. 
and uh, and it's constantly growing. So that's one of the you know beautiful things about Cosmos is it's something that we're always adding to and um, and and building upon so that you can have more and more assets at at your disposal. Mm. And it's it's knowing that it's continuing to grow. I mean, looking at this, there's 540 fabrics, just fabrics. So um, you're not really going to be running out or repeating <laughs> uh, assets uh, with, with a very um, uh, constricted library. This is definitely very expansive and and one for everyone to just uh, just keep an eye on, especially the updates that come out very regularly regularly. So um, yeah, like I said, um, scatter. This is another thing that um, VOE veterans would would know quite a lot about already. And we use this for uh, just as a way to to imitate some of the landscape that you can see here. So this is another um, this is a, a clip that Lon took with his drone when he went to visit the site uh, la early last year, maybe Lon? Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, so we were working with uh, Koto Design as well as the landscape architect that they were working with called Steve Martino. If any of you guys um, know of his work, if you don't check it out, it's, it's incredible. It's, um, the sort of desert landscapes, it's uh, very, very cool to, to look at. And a big part of their design was recreating a dried riverbed. So this is a, just to give a bit of context, the front door is here. The steps to get up to the front door are kind of underneath us to the right. And there's this amazing cantilevered, uh, well, sky bridge, walkway, whatever you want to call it, um, with uh, glass bottoms that you can look down. And uh, for us, what we needed to do was a way to just generate lots and lots of assets along this dry riverbed without having to manually place them. So you can see here that. Um, I was talking over the first part, but I've basically created a host, which is the dry riverbed, and then added lots of other objects. So in this instance, you can see the three types of rocks uh, that I've added. And what I'm doing now is running an interactive render and just tweaking the, the density, um, some of the other factors like uh, min and max rotation, um, min and max scale. And you can see that it's just uh, allowing me to parametrically parametrically, that's a tough one, uh, just to, to generate lots and lots of different um, models um, without having to manually place them. Just generally, it's, um, it's, it's a way to do more whilst taking less time doing it. It's, uh, it's something we use on a daily basis as well. Um, something that you may have noticed is that I added a bitmap as well in the density slot. Um, so if you guys can um, see that in here, um, it just allows you to, again, further manipulate where you're placing these objects. Okay, so now I'm going to begin to start wrapping up by talking about the animation uh, that we produced for this project, which I want to show you now. So this is supposed to have music, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that on just whilst I'm talking. Um, camera animation within SketchUp and V-Ray you can use this to create walk uh, walkthroughs or fly throughs, as I'm sure um, some of you guys have already experimented with. Um, what we decided to do was rather than a classical fly through or walk through, to really focus on specific areas of uh, the design. So Koto Design and, and the client were really keen to look at this concept of moments and highlighting very small, uh, like vignettes, small areas of the model to just help build a bigger picture of what the whole project is about. So the way that you do that is initially within SketchUp, setting your camera, um, looking at the eye height, field of view, focal distance within uh, the camera section of the asset editor, like all of the typical stuff. And then you would set a second viewpoint, set a, sec uh, a second scene. And what would happen is you would then program SketchUp to transition from scene one to scene two. And in doing so, you then, it, well, you get to experience the space in, um, well, more of like the fourth, <laughs> fourth dimension with, with time, uh, with the time element as well. Um, so once you've got those keyframes, you can actually adjust the lighting conditions for each, scenes, uh, each scene as well. So you may have noticed in some of these, there were big like time skips. 
you know, where we might have set the time of day at say 10 a.m. Uh, I think in the kitchen shot, if you saw the light sort of slowly sweep around, um, it might start at 10 a.m., but then it finishes at two o'clock. So you can create really cool effects. Like you can see on the hillside up there, um, it again plays into this you know, story of how the sunlight is the main protagonist. What we would then do with all of these clips, we would then stitch them together and put them into something that we call a paper edit, which some of you guys might be doing already, which is where you can stitch, uh, you stitch all of these together and put them to music. Um, you can then get some feedback, you know, um, apply any amendments if you need to. And when you're happy and you've got confirmation, you could render out the final images, the sorry, the final clips, which come in a series of images. Um, you then kind of load that back into the paper edit and you've got a finalized animation, you know, add some logos and some, um, uh, well, some pretty bits at the start and the end. And then you've got something that is looking a whole lot more polished. Um, you definitely can do this type of stuff in Enscape and Vantage as well. Uh, but what we were looking for with this is a way to um, really use uh, GPU rendering, frame rendering, to um, kind of tie in with the way that we've always worked. Um, we wanted to use, we wanted to render out this project uh, frame by frame, so in image sequences, and um, it's just what we know. So Enscape is definitely a, a solution more of a pre-visualization solution. So you may or may not be able to achieve the same uh, quality as, as this. Um, but yeah, this is incredibly, incredibly uh, happy with how this went. This is one of, the, um, uh, one of the best projects we've ever worked on, for sure, animation-wise. So yeah, this kind of naturally leads into hardware. And I'd just like to say, you know, those of you that don't know, V-Ray's typically known as a ray tracing program. So this is where you can imagine a ray of light traced from the viewer's eye, kind of like it's through each pixel in the image and then into the scene. Uh, so imagine like a laser. Um, so as the ray passes through the scene, what it's doing is then interacting with various objects and is bouncing off them or through them and it accumulates color and other visual information. And to create the ray traced image, what the computer then needs to do is trace millions and millions and millions of these rays through the scene, calculating the color and intensity um, of each pixel by factoring in things like um, well, materials, lights, shadow, that type of thing. Um, the, I mean, I like to think about this. I bring this up because it just highlights what you're actually asking of your hardware whenever you press that render button. Um, now, on this project, like I said, we used uh, GPUs more so than CPUs. And the reason for that is GPUs are typically better at ray tracing than CPUs, as there's vastly higher number of cores, which means they're just optimized for parallel processing. So they can calculate more efficiently and faster. Now, in our case, as I mentioned earlier, we were using NVIDIA's A6, RTX A6000 GPUs. And these were used to perform all of those calculations that I mentioned before, tracing millions and millions of rays um, throughout all of our images and scaled up to several thousand frames of our animation, which I just showed you. So um, this now seems like a really good point. Now I'm talking about GPUs to pass over to the real expert uh, mm -hmm. on, on these. Um, so I'm about to hand you over to Andrew, uh, Andrew Rink from NVIDIA, who leads the global marketing strategy. And I know that he's uh, very excited to share his insights on how advanced tech can help businesses like ours and like yours um, to revolutionize your processes. So Andrew, um, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much. Um, I almost feel like I don't even need to present because you, your description was so right on. It, it, it was really perfect. It really is mind boggling the amount of compute that's required for, for ray tracing, you know, especially these high fidelity images. It, it's, 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 it really is astonishing. Um, and Dan, I've got to say, outstanding work, what we've just seen. Probably my only critique would be, I would like to have seen that Jeff character sitting at the piano with his glass of wine. Really <laughs> we can arrange that. We can arrange yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no, really, it's a tremendous example um, uh, of 
the kind of real time high quality visualization that um, you know we can all do now with, with RTX. Um, uh, uh, and, but what I want to do was just share some uh, technical details with you about uh, the latest generation of GPU microarchitecture that NVIDIA introduced a, a few months ago. You're probably scanning um, some of these uh, you know, bullets on here, but uh, our previous generation architecture was named Ampere. Many of you will, will know that. And this new generation, yeah, it's, it's named after uh, the English mathematician, uh, Ada Lovelace. Uh, she's considered by many as, as the first computer programmer. And that was in the 1840s. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's a while back. But uh, I think the interesting side note uh, she was the only legitimate child of Lord Byron. <laughs> so anyway, let's just look at a couple of the new features of, of this ADA architecture. Firstly, uh, new streaming multiprocessors. It's a, it's a new generation of CUDA cores. Um, and these, are, these provide now up to 90 teraflops of single precision compute FP32 performance uh, at twice the power efficiency. Well, we also introduced third generation RT cores. Uh, Lon alluded to this. This is the, the ray tracing hardware that's on the chip now. Um, and these um, um, now uh, deliver up to 2x faster ray triangle intersection uh, than our previous gen. Um, and then we've got other features like a, an opacity map engine, uh, a displaced micro mesh engine, which uh, generates displaced micro triangles on the fly. So, all this and, and more features uh, essentially combine to make ray tracing more efficient. So you know, your high quality renders are completed much more quickly. That's the, that's the bonus out of all this tech. Uh, in addition, we introduced the fourth generation of tensor cores uh, and that, that supports the new FP8 data format, which reduces data storage and, and improves performance as well. There's a new optical flow engine, um, which enables uh, NVIDIA DLS, uh, DLSS3, that's our deep learning super sampling. Uh, so, so that we can generate more accurate frames without any artifacts. Um, and of course, this new ADA generation GPU uh, architecture provides a ton of uh, video encode and decode performance uh, and, and capacity, uh, as you can read here. Free and encode, free decode engines, along with support for AV1 encode and decode. Uh, we've got uh, four JPEG decoders also included to, to accelerate workloads with JPEG images, like um, AI augmented image processing. So an amazing amount of technology uh, packed into a, a tiny chip. And that chip is at the heart of uh, the world's most powerful desktop workstation GPU that's built for professionals, the NVIDIA RTX 6000 ADA generation GPU. It's a ultra high end GPU. It delivers a, about twice the performance uh, of the previous generation. That was our RTX A6000. We now have um, over 18,000 CUDA cores. So to put that into perspective, when I joined NVIDIA 10 years ago, our flagship GPU was the K6000. Many of you remember that one. That was our paper, Kepler Gen, the K6000. That had uh, just over 2,800 CUDA cores. So it's a 6x increase in, in, in that time period. So, but this 6 series, this 6000 series, now the ADA Gen 1, it's a big GPU, right? Dual slot, full length, actively cool. 48 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. So that is, uh, you know, largest VRAM on the planet. Um, and it's critical for the workloads that Tan's been showing, you know, when you've got, you're using up so much of the VRAM for the, for when you work with the Chaos Vantage, for example. So that means you can tackle the toughest workloads, everything from the kind of high performance graphics and rendering that, that Dan's been showing and, and Lon, Lon talks about, uh, to um, NVIDIA Omniverse, you know, large scale simulation of virtual worlds. Uh, all kinds of AI, machine learning, data science uh, workloads, uh, and of course, uh, streaming and video content. Now, uh, professional GPUs need powerful workstations. So let me hand it over to Chris from Lenovo, who will go over um, uh, recommended workstation configurations. Thanks so much, Andrew. And thanks, Dan, for uh, sharing this fabulous project. I, I, every time I see it, I'm in awe of the quality of the rendering, the storytelling and the connection with the viewer that you guys have achieved is really, really stunning work. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes looking at a couple of workstation recommendations for those who are working with V-Ray, with SketchUp, or any other of the CAD, CAD solutions that V-Ray plugs into. 
you know, when I joined Lenovo a few years ago, I came from the software world. And, you know, back then I had no idea even what a workstation is and what much less what was under the hood. So you'll see a few slides here. They'll have some speeds and feeds, but I'll try, we'll try and keep it high level about uh, which workstation solution is right for which type of workflow. And then uh, we'll leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. And of course, our, our draw for a chance to win the fabulous uh, ThinkStation P16 mobile workstation. So the fir first up is the uh, ThinkStation P620. This is a desktop workstation. It's based around the Threadripper Pro uh, architecture, which will take up to 64 cores, as well as the latest generation in NVIDIA uh, GPUs. This is really meant as a desktop workstation powerhouse for those of you who need the fastest uh, real-time rendering performance, whether uh, whether you're doing it real-time or pre-rendered sequences. Uh, it, you can leverage both the, the GPU as well as the CPU. Um, the advantage of the Threadripper Pro processor set is that the it comes with high core count, but also a very high clock speed for uh, allowing you to get the most out of your CAD application. I saw somebody who mentioned Revit. It's, um, they all work the same way, SketchUp, Revit. All of the CAD applications require a very hot clock speed to get the most out of them. This uh, workstation, the P620, allows you to house, um, you know, whatever GPU, NVIDIA GPU, that you see fit right up to the latest generation, A6000. Let's hit the next one. Another one that's a favorite of ours is the P360 Ultra. And you see two workstations on this slide. Uh, the P360 Ultra is the one to the left next to the tower. It's just, um, it's you can fit it in the palm of your hand. It's really only about eight inches high. Uh, it supports the latest uh, 12th generation of the uh, Intel uh, CPUs. It also allows you to put in either an RTX uh, A2000 desktop uh, graphics board, which is uh, 12 gigabytes, or an A5500 mobile, uh, which I can't see the actual memory uh, uh, configuration here, 16 gigabytes, uh, which is slightly higher memory. This is a desktop workstation for those who, you know, need to do BIM design, rendering, visualization in tight spaces. It'll fit either on the desktop or underneath. And you can see the difference between um, uh, the two side by side. You can even toss it in a backpack if you need uh, desktop power on the go. Uh, and it also has an extremely high clock speed. So the advantage here is that you can run your CAD applications as quickly as possible, and you get decent support for uh, rendering and visualization with uh, two high level RTX board options. Let's hit the next one. So the ThinkPad P1, uh, a favorite of ours, Dan was actually doing his presentation from P1. I'm doing mine from a P1 as well. Uh, what we like about it is that it's thin and light, 16 inches. It's based around the 12th gen H-class um, CPUs from Intel. And you can put up to an RTX A5500. Again, this, this is a 16 gigabyte GPU, which will run uh, V-Ray and SketchUp very, very well. Uh, it's also got an ultra performance mode, which allows the GPU to run uh, very effectively in a small package while managing uh, the cooling. It's about 18 millimeters thick and it's under two kilos. It's thin and light is what I take with me um, on the road. You can jack up the memory to 64 gigabytes. Um, and again, uh, we love the high clock speed. So it allows you to do both your CAD and your visualization on the go if you need thin and light. Now let's have a little bit of fun. Let's go to the next one and we'll look at uh, the P16. This is the first generation uh, of the P16. And what's so exciting about it is that it's basically like taking um, uh, desktop performance on the go with you. It'll perform at about the same level as that P360 Ultra that we showed you in a mobile uh, form factor. Uh, it's got the 12th gen HX class processors from Intel, and you can put up to an A5500 GPU in it from NVIDIA, the RTX A5500. Uh, and because of its size 
and the power that it's running at, it will run the GPU uh, more effectively uh, with less uh, thermal, uh, you know, with uh, without uh, thermally um, uh, throttling. So it's it's a fabulous machine. It's the one that we're going to give away, and I guess this is the moment we've all been waiting for for the uh, 112 folks who are on the uh, you know, on the call right now. Thank you for joining, and we're going to do a draw. And the name will be passed to me. Draw, virtual drum roll. Fingers and you <laughs> should be able to look in the host chat. Do you see that, Chris? We the have host chat. Okay, I have ourselves that. a winner. Okay, how do I uh, go back to the host chat? Q and A chat. Call of suspense is killing me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know this is terrible. And it's coming down to user error here. Who, who is? Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of bums on the edges of their seats. I know. <laughs> trying to bring up the host chat. It's yeah. everyone's commenting as well, so it's it's driving it further and further. Away. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, can somebody please give me a hint? how to bring up the host chat? Do you want me to? Um... Want me to announce the winner on the, the, the yes. chat here? Okay, so with without further ado, our winner is Ian Livesley. Ian Livesley is our raffle winner. Congratulations. Congratulations, Ian. We will follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, the machine is on order, but it will take a little bit to get to you. But we really appreciate uh, everyone joining us today. And I think we've got, uh, oh yeah, we've got one more slide. Yeah, let's go go to the next slide here. Uh, quick message about uh, the efforts that we're putting in to improving our carbon footprint with all of our uh, workstations. All of our packaging is now recycled packaging. Uh, we're seeing up to 60% uh, performance per watt when we look at an older P360 versus the, or of the older P350 versus the new P360 today. The packaging is smaller, um, power is far more efficient with the different, uh, if you look at the NVIDIA GPU alone and the power consumption in the latest generation of uh, graphics boards, it, it allows us to run the GPU more effectively with less power. So we're, we're very excited and proud of what we've been doing to reduce our carbon footprint with uh, all of our workstations. Now, without further ado, I know there are a ton of questions in the Q&A. Why don't we move over, open all, all the mics up for Q&A, and we'll see if we can answer all of your questions. That sounds good. I'm going to put the gallery view on. Hopefully that, uh, that happens there. So the first question I see, Dan, is probably one for you. How many people worked on the Palm Springs project and how much time uh, did it take? That's a really good question. I think the um, the project itself, it spanned quite a long time. So there's there lots of design amendments throughout. So to model up the, the main building that you saw, as well as the landscape, so that's all the topography, the hardscaping, things like the dry riverbed that I mentioned as well. Um, I would say all in probably about five days, um, five, eight hour days. So like a regular working week. And then the interior design, there was a lot of back and forth on that. So it's probably about a day and a half for each space, maybe maybe a couple of days uh, with design review meetings. Great, I, there's a, a question here, is Vantage coming to Corona anytime soon? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, the, the short answer is I'm not sure. Right now, Vantage is really built on V-Ray uh, materials and lights and so on to, to transition that over. So um, there'd probably be quite a bit of work in order to get uh, Corona in there. Um, but uh, definitely stay tuned on our website and Corona's website uh, to see you know, if there's advances that happen in there in the future. Uh, I do see one here. I think we might have addressed this. Vantage is great, but is there any way of creating a video walkthrough along a camera path rather than scene to scene? Well, when Dan was showing you was done in SketchUp, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think SketchUp's animation tools are pretty limited to what yeah. you can do um, in scene to scene. So if you were looking to do a specific camera path, um, you can obviously you can record a camera path in, in Vantage, or you could create a specific one, say in a tool like 
3ds max and then export that camera into vantage and it will use that path so you can't do it it's just um i'm not sure sketchup is um makes that possible mm. um and one of the things that has impressed me with with Dan and the team is like I feel like you guys push push uh, pushed SketchUp to the limits of what you know what is possible in that uh, program. Yeah. Is pretty, it, pretty it, awesome. it pushed back as well. Um, let me just say, <laughs> just to stand on us. Uh, question for you, Dan: Did you use Chaos Cosmos to put the rocks in the the Gabion walls with the mesh? Yeah, that's actually, um, I forgot to mention that, but there's the, there's another plugin you can get called MS Physics. Um, yeah, let me know in the chat if you've used it before. But um, yeah, I basically used uh, the rocks, kind of dumped, basically I ran this script that dropped hundreds and hundreds of, of the Cosmos rocks into a box. And then we that's when we started looking at the, uh, like how we're going to contain them once we've sort of, sort of got them all in place. So yeah, uh, we, have a question, we have a question about the volumetric or or IES lighting in the in the pool. Somebody was curious to how you were able to make the the pool lights. Yeah, so that that is just an IES light. Um, in terms, we could have made it volumetric. Um, if if we would have done that, then I would have just set the um, kind of like the fog height, the atmospheric fog height, to the right amount. But uh, for that, we didn't really need to make it actually volumetric. Uh, we do have a question about back to Cosmos here. Um, somebody mentioned that sometimes the assets, uh, like the leaves, look a little too dark. Um, and do the models need to be merged and the materials changed? Um, do you, how often do you find yourself uh, adjusting or tweaking anything that you're, you're bringing in from Cosmos? I think the... Um, it's uh, not as often as you'd think. Um, for things like cars, that's quite a common one. Um, you know, you want to be able to reuse the same model of car without having to find a different model elsewhere. You know, there's only a, there is only a finite amount. Um, so you can always merge the Cosmos assets, and then you what you'll find is you can change some of the materials that exist within that asset, and that's fairly easy to do. Um, we. Yeah, that's fairly easy to do. Um, I I would say we do it maybe for every interior. We probably do it on like one or two objects. So it's, it's not like we're doing it on every single one. Yeah, we have a question here too. When will animated objects be coming to to uh, Chaos Vantage or trees and grass moving? Um, you can actually do that now. Uh, you would just have to bring in those animated proxies from something like 3ds Max and have the animation uh, baked in. So you you can actually have animation. Um, you won't necessarily see it while you're uh, while you're moving through. You'll see it as you scrub and it'll stop, or when you when you render out mm -hmm. of it. I um, must say, if if I was to do this project again, that's what I would be including. Yeah. Yeah, animated vegetation. I think that's that's the real giveaway of, you know, is this a CGI or is it um is it photorealistic? You know, is is it uh so why, you know, once somebody's asking why SketchUp, you know, as a professional art biz artist, what what's drawn you to to SketchUp as your you know tool of, of choice? Well, I think um I started with SketchUp like many other people, straight out of university when you're poor but have a lot of time to learn. So um, that's that's kind of how we got into it. And it was one of those cases where we didn't really feel ever feel the need to move into programs like 3ds Max, you know, despite sort of pressure um, elsewhere, because SketchUp just did the job. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can achieve um, most types of imagery in SketchUp um, without having to go over to 3ds Max. It's only for the more advanced stuff, like Lon mentioned, with the camera tracks, camera tracking for, say, like animated photo montages. Um, that would be a that would be a way that I would move over. But for the most part, SketchUp it, it does the job. Yeah, and somebody's asking a you know a different question, but it's related. Is um, you know what kind of tricks do you use? Are you using lots of proxies, or or how are you keeping things within sort of the memory limit and uh, keeping the scene 
speedy um yeah nimble. yeah i love that question i, I could talk about the uh, optimization uh, for, for days but it's all about keeping your files clean and organized as you'd expect it's um uh, most people that that come through the academy at some point they've they've tried to use v-ray and they've said oh, my, my machine can't run it you know I, I can't produce renders and it's in part in part, it probably is because maybe your hardware could do with being improved, uh, which is where the likes of, of Chris and Andrew can obviously help. But I do genuinely believe there is a case for everyone can optimize a little bit better than they're probably than they probably think they can right now. So things like proxies, like you mentioned, Lon, um, using sort of new features like Enmesh, um, just keeping things organized in your asset library. Um, so within your asset editor, not having things in there that sort of don't exist in the model anymore you know what i mean so just just keep your files lighter um by purging whenever you can using proxies wherever you can and you, you'll just find things run a whole lot smoother and i think even for this scene too you had multiple rooms in the house with details in that so you kind of worked on different sections of it and would focus on it and keep the models of those clean and then bring it all together at you know at the end when you needed it or keep them separate for yeah. you know smaller things definitely yes yeah, fit the files up if you need to i just get it's the only thing that matters is the shots you're trying to create so if there's anything that aren't that isn't related to that shot then you could just make a new file and kind of cull the rest so um and this is a, a good question too about the the gpus right um so you were using gpus throughout this project um you know one question somebody's wondering do you need an rtx gpu to to do what you did um, maybe I could start start a little bit. You do need an RTX card to use Vantage uh, because it's using the ray tracing cores on it. Um, V-Ray GPU can use um, uh, earlier cards than the RTX generation, but we do have V-Ray GPU that taps into that RTX. So you're, you're going to get uh, some speed ups from that. Uh, but if you do have an earlier generation of uh, uh, an NVIDIA card, it's you know you can render V-Ray um with it it's it's not yeah. quite as fast as what you get with the new ones definitely um and somebody's asking and related to that is, is what kind of speed ups did you see using gpu rendering now like this was you know this was a big test for you guys in your studio mm. to, to kind of take all this uh, great hardware and, and put it to the test yeah how, how much did you feel like it sped up your your renders and your workflow i think it's there's two ways of answering that and i think speed is just one of them but capacity is the other so the speed of the rendering increased as you know as i mentioned earlier in my presentation and and andrew mentioned in his it's um the number of cores within your gpu is uh it's kind of it that's what makes your rendering faster um the parallel processing abilities of the gpu in in our case we we saw that renders that were taking maybe a couple of hours, they were getting finished in like 10 minutes using our RTX A6000. Um, but something else to tag on to the end of that is that the it's the the VRAM. So kind of like bandwidth, how much how much can you actually render without having to split your file up and you know kind of leave it leave it somewhere else and kind of focus on a small area. Um, that's what we found to be the the biggest thing because we wanted to try and create an environment that you could go and look at the the dry riverbed or the, all of the rocks there or you could go and take a look inside the living room and all of these assets are all in that one master file and i think using a cpu based system you'd really struggle with that so i i think um you know we'll, we'll probably address some of the rest of these questions we'll type in some answers uh, right after this but we're at the top of the hour so i think it's a good time for us to to sort of wrap up here um, I, I just want to say, you know, thank you to Dan, to Andrew, to Chris for you guys coming on and sharing, uh, you know, your insights. Also, this is a project that has been, you know, something that we've been doing for for a while now. And it's just amazing to, you know, see it all come to life and, and following Dan's work and this team that we've assembled to, you know, to make this project uh, happen has is, is just been, mm. um, you know, such a fantastic and rewarding experience. So. I'm happy that we've been able to share it with everybody here today. Um, and, Definitely. Uh, and can I so add I as well? Say thank you guys. Go ahead. Can I add as well? This um, this wasn't me. This 
this wasn't all me. It was most of the work was done by the team. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, it was most of it was done by the team, and and Lon has been a, a massive driving force in in pushing this project forwards. And um, we, yeah, we've loved working with with all of you guys and with Koto Design as well. Um, it's been a really nice process and uh, a bit of a flagship project for us. Great. Well, we'll stay check back if you want to see the recording. We'll have it live, um, you know, in, in just a, as soon as we can. And uh, we'll make sure we try to answer some more of the, the questions here in the, the chat. But thanks so much, everybody, and, and uh, take care. Thank Cheers you. Home. Cheers.